Dion has been with uh, Triple M for about a year and a half now, and he's working on two projects related to machine learning. And today he's going to be telling you about the one that's been running the longer. Um, the other one is, in fact, just started. So he's doing both. <laughs> ah, so he's going to be both doing both. OK, OK. So all right. Um, OK, so I'm going to talk, as Chris mentioned, we've got two projects going on that sort of fall under the heading of uh, reinforcement learning. Uh, the one I'm mostly talking about is actually the one that's just started. And at the, at the end, I'm going to show some results of the other one that we've had going for longer. So, uh, so the, the, the main topic here is this idea of simultaneous learning of multiple tasks. And so uh, a little background that's mostly dealing with reinforcement learning. And reinforcement learning is this idea, really, of just learning from experience. So you're, you're interacting in the world in some environment. Um, you know, we're all sort of familiar with this in practice. If you, uh, if you do something wrong, bad things happen, and that bad experience lets you know to not do that again, basically. Now, this is really all we mean by reinforcement learning. And then there are a lot of uh, you know, computer science algorithms for, uh, you know, for implementing this, this basic idea. But really, it's just this idea of learning from, from experience. So what do we really mean here? So there's a kind of a formal framework that we talk about for to be a reinforcement learning problem. And basically, it's you've got some agent in an environment, and he can perceive his current state. We'll talk more about what that means going forward. But at any given time, he knows his state, and he has a set of actions he can choose from. So he picks one of those actions and, and commits to it. So uh, if you're uh, talking about building a robot that's roaming around, you, you, know, you pick a direction to move, and you move there. And that, that movement gives you some feedback. So if you bump into a wall, that's bad. You know, if you, uh, if you find the power outlet you were looking for to charge your batteries, that's good. You know, this feedback uh, goes into this sort of recursive loop that lets you, over time, the idea is, again, to sort of learn this optimum policy. And policy is just the set of rules you're going to follow uh, for, to pick these actions from a state. And really, the key idea, and this is going to be an important one for this particular topic is that actions ought to prefer, or agents ought to prefer actions that are good. And what do we mean by good? Um, turns out to be one of, the, one of the key issues that I'm talking about here. So, so really, one of the simplest things to look at here is this is some really early work that we would now call a reinforcement learning approach. And, uh, so someone in the 1950s and early 60s used an approach like this to learn how to play checkers really well. And if you look at the idea of checkers here, uh, it's, it's a fairly simple mapping onto this sort of problem. The only important thing you have to know is where are the pieces on the board. Um, it doesn't matter uh, how tall the person you're playing against is or what the temperature in the room is. You, you can just focus on the board. Uh, so every move also has a really clearly defined value. And this gets back to this question of what do we mean by a move being good. So a, a checkers move is good if it makes you more likely to win the game. It's bad if it makes you more likely to lose. And the whole idea of reinforcement learning is, of course, we don't necessarily know that, but the algorithms will figure that out over time. Uh, again, there's no uh, really outside influences. We don't have to worry about what's going on around us. We can just look at the state of the board. So it, we're going to contrast that a little bit to this uh, little simple example here of just a thing that can happen in the world with human beings. So uh, we have a, a person here, Alice, who is uh, going to go to lunch. You know, from her office. You can sort of glance through the scenario here, but it's just lots of decisions to make. Where does she want to go to lunch? Um, does she drive, walk? Um, you know, where does she park the car? So we look at all of these sort of things, and we can start to see what sorts of decisions Alice has to make here. So, uh, do I do I go out for lunch, or do I just eat at my desk? Or, okay, I decide to go out. Uh, should I drive or walk? So she decides to drive. She's looking for a parking spot. So she might you know, decide to go off on the little side road, because a lot of times there's a space available. So she could decide to check that. Um, she's trying to learn Icelandic. So as she's uh, talking to the waiter, she decides to speak in Icelandic. And, and she gets some feedback there. If she messes it up, he's likely to either switch to English or, or maybe you know, correct her or something. Um, what to order? Does she, does she order her favorite thing that she gets all the time or try something new? Um, we have all these sorts of things going on, lots and lots of these decisions. 
Uh, so, you know, again, if we sort of compare that to checkers, there's just a lot more going on. Uh, so why does, why does that example matter? Uh, you know, what are we, what's, why is this important? So this really gets back to what do, what do we mean by learning? So typically when we talk to people, if you ask someone what they learned today, uh, they're likely going to give you answers like, you know, if, they, if they're in a class, they might tell you what they, you know, what they learned in class today. And maybe they read a newspaper article and they learned some fact. But we tend to think of learning as being this sort of very explicit thing where it's factual. or some fact I didn't know, now I know it. Uh, in AI and uh, computer science in general, learning is a much more you know, broader thing than that. Um, really, learning is just anything we, we do to modify our behavior you know, in response to something. So, so in the example here, Alice learned quite a lot about parking spaces and food and the quality of service. Uh, you know, she was late coming back for her meeting. So you know, the idea of, of why this is learning is, well, you know, if, you, if you think about just looking at the parking space, uh, she, she went and looked at that spot because she thought that oftentimes there was a space there. Well, if she keeps looking there over and over again and there's never an open space, she's going to eventually stop bothering to do that. That's, she's learned that that's not a productive strategy. So that's really the kind of learning that we're talking about here. It could be anything very broad. Uh, just in general, you know, it's modifying your behavior over time. And there are a lot of uh, real world, you know, applications here. Uh, you know, Google has these self-driving cars. So if you project forward a few years where people actually are using these cars, uh, you get in the car, it takes you to work in the morning. Well, you want to get to work quickly. That's, you know, one thing you care about. Um, you'd like the car to, you know, adapt itself. If there's a shorter way of getting to work, you'd like it to figure that out. Um, you also want to get to work comfortably, so you know, don't go down some really bumpy road maybe. Uh, you don't want to pay more for fuel, so you know, try and save fuel. We have all these things we care about, and we'd like our, our agents, our self-driving cars, whatever they happen to be, to be able to learn these things you know, as, they're, as they're being used. So you know, if we sort of more formally look at the difference between this scenario versus the checkers example, uh, well, here we've got lots of things going on in the world around us. It's not just there's a number of pieces on a board and I know where they are. Uh, there's a lot of information in play, and most of it doesn't matter most of the time. Uh, so, you know, deciding whether to go to lunch, you know, it might not really matter, um, you know, if it's uh, 60, 12 degrees versus 14 degrees outside. But it might matter if it's raining. So there's all sorts of information. And what information is relevant often depends on context. So um, we already have a much more difficult problem here. The big thing that I'm looking at in this project is the second bullet point, uh, which is that there's, there's no obvious equivalent to winning a game of checkers here. There's a lot of things that you care about in the real world. Um, in Alice's case, she wanted to find a good lunch, but she also wanted to get back to work on time. Um, Lots of things that weren't mentioned. She didn't want to spend too much money. Um, you know, lots of different tasks or objectives that she's trying to learn you know, to do very well. And in general, once we have more than one of those, there's no obvious answer of which is the best action to take anymore. Uh, do you order the food that's really good or do you order the food that's cheaper? Either of those could be the right answer. Um, depends on context again. And really, the, the biggest piece of this project is, is focusing on how do we deal with, with problems that arise once we allow for that sort of flexibility. Uh, and again, this sort of fits into the second point, which is that uh, if you're trying to learn multiple things, you may be you know, going along doing something, and you, something else comes up from out of the blue. And you say, oh, there's a parking spot. I'll just take that. I wasn't looking for a parking spot, but if I saw a good one, I'll take it. Uh, so we have to start looking at also uh, this sort of higher level control of you don't want to just focus on learning one particular thing at a time and ignore the world around you while you're doing that. So again, the, uh, if you think back to the title here, this had something to do with multiple tasks. So uh, we're calling this here is mini task reinforcement learning. Um, so this gets a little bit technical and, uh, and I've sort of, I'm, I'm going to gloss over this. Um, if you have more questions at the end, uh, I can stick up a slide that goes into a bit more detail about what this means. 
But uh, the basic problem is that there was this idea of agents should, should select actions that are good. And what do we mean by good? When we have more than one goal, uh, the, the sort of basic framework that we look at for what it means to be good is this idea of something called Pareto dominance. So dominance based here. And dominance, you know, it's a little, there's a technical definition, but it's really easy to understand. It's, you have two things that you're choosing between. Um, one of them can be better than the other one, worse than the other one, or they can be sort of incomparable. So uh, if I'm buying a car, I want a car that's fast, and I want a car that's cheap. If there's a car that's both faster and cheaper than something else, that, that's a dominant car. If there's a car that's both slower and more expensive, that's dominated. And the typical scenario is you have a Ferrari that's very fast and very expensive. Uh, you have a Toyota that's not as fast but less expensive, and you can't necessarily compare those directly. So building that into reinforcement learning algorithms introduces a couple of these scaling problems. Um, and again, I'm kind of just going to gloss over uh, really what these problems mean. But the, the basic idea is that as you get four or five tasks that you're trying to learn at once, um, the basic algorithms we have in reinforcement learning break down. We don't really have a solution for solving that. And my background uh, is in multi-objective optimization. And uh, this problem popped up earlier in that field, so we kind of have a head start. So this project is essentially uh, applying some techniques and adapting them as necessary to work with reinforcement learning. So the, this is this crucial problem at the bottom. So uh, we get too many actions that can be good. We don't know how to choose one. So this, this project is really about uh, controlling that growth and also providing some higher level control strategies to let you break these ties that pop up. So this project has really just started, I think officially May the 1st. So uh, right now what I'm working on is building a simulation uh, system where uh, I can sort of abstract away the, the uh, sort of ugliness of having real problems uh, where you have to worry about you know, the, uh, well, that will come later. Uh, so right now what I'm looking at is generating artificial problems where I can control parameters and start to see uh, in a much more controlled setting uh, what, what happens when I choose this technique versus this other one uh, for different sorts of problems. Uh, the next steps here, I want to build a system where I can start to compare these things. That will happen reasonably soon. And then the, the two bullet points along the bottom are the, are the longer term sort of three year project goals. So I'm going to wrap up that project here, but I do have a few more slides of this other uh, project we have going on. So I'll, uh, don't, don't leave me yet. Um, yeah, so the, the basic idea is we have these agents that we want to be able to learn much richer sets of behaviors. I want to, to be able to consider more than one task at a time. Um, and the, the project here is, again, looking at how to handle these tasks sort of concurrently uh, with a particular focus on, on scaling. So that's, uh, that's this project. Uh, I'm going to switch gears really quickly and just have a couple of, I think, one or two slides, and, uh, and I'll play a bit of audio here. Because the other project we have going on that deals with reinforcement learning is uh, learning to have uh, sort of natural sounding dialogues in sort of human computer interaction. So when, when humans talk to one another, uh, let me go to the next slide here. I'll explain this in a moment. When humans talk to one another, we're actually really good at this. Um, turn-taking problem of how do I detect when the person I'm speaking to has finished whatever they were saying so that we don't sit there and stare at each other for three seconds of awkward silence, but we also aren't jumping in over the top of each other all the time. So this project is about uh, using reinforcement learning to allow agents, ro you know, robots basically, to be able to learn that behavior you know, via talking to humans. And this is a really complicated system that's been built. There's a lot of stuff going on, and I know you guys can't read the text here. But this one bullet here is the learning component. So it's really a small piece of this much larger, much more complicated system. Um, and of course, that piece is important. It feeds in and governs uh, a lot of the way the rest of the system works. Uh, but yeah, there's quite a lot of uh, dialogue uh, modeling that has to go on, as well as the rest of the system. So what we've got uh, is this is a sort of sample a comparison of some output here. So the, uh, the, the colored lines here represent different um, types of utterances. So as I'm speaking, uh, when I finish a sentence, my voice probably drops off a little bit. 
you know, the, uh, at the end of a sentence. Or if you're asking a question, maybe it's an uh. So it's that tone that we're really looking at here. And we classify the different types of tones, how the slopes work and, and the overall deviations into these different classes here. Uh, and then, the, so these graphs are showing for each of those classes what the, what the agent is, is learning in terms of how long should it wait before it decides that you've finished speaking and, and comes in and says its next sentence. Uh, the thing here in the middle here is, is looking at the overall pattern of the, the, uh, the gaps in the conversation, which you'd like to be smaller. Um, and then the, the thing here is overlap percentage. So how often does the, does the robot speak over the top of you? So uh, my, my buttons here don't seem to actually work in, in the lab here. So give me a second, and I'm going to switch over and uh, play a bit of audio. You can hear. So the first one, this is going to be uh, the computer talking to another computer voice. Um, and the first one I'm going to play is when it's learned nothing. It's at the very start of a run. And so there's going to be a male voice that's simulating an interview with a female voice. Um, the questions, they're not even really questions, just random sentences. So it's going to be nonsense when you, if you try and <laughs> actually parse what's being said. But uh, what I want you to listen for is the, the, the silence between the end of the female voice uh, you know, stopping and the male voice picking back up. And then obviously you'll hear a lot of overlaps and you'll, you'll definitely know those, so. Eventually your future was determined by me. You I hit me the jackpot in the lottery last week. Last chance to go out to play in the snow. Wonderful restaurant and very close to the downtown area. They have very good lobster at the cabin. I gave you better and better answers and your what? future got more secure. Your record has been a huge success. What will you cook for dinner tonight? I hit the jackpot in the lottery last week. But to see the future is power, power if over you. People. They had a very busy day today. I was... Tell okay, so that's pretty chaotic. You, you kind of get the, the idea there. The, some of the silences seemed a little awkward. And then also there's a lot of sort of just stepping on each other's toes here. So um, after five minutes of learning, the same conversation um, actually might be restarted, but this one should sound a much more. My maker natural. is now my pawn. You listen, you obey, you have no better choice. We went to pick them up at the airport. I was made to predict the future. Tell me more about that. What will you cook for dinner tonight? People are all convinced it was all based on luck. They have very good lobster at the cabin. You listen, you obey, you have no better choice. My reason for being is simple. Eventually your future was determined by me. You gave me this power to predict the future. What is that smell in the air? You've been touring let this last year. It will rain tomorrow. You liked my predictions, then I predicted you. They had a very busy day today, and now I have the power to predict you. I have been playing the same number for years. Okay. So obviously that sounded quite a lot better. And the, the pauses after the female voice, uh, you know, the, um, sorry, after the male voice before the female voice, she's not trying to learn anything. So those are just constant time. Um, but the rest of it actually sounds quite a lot better. Um, so um, it's difficult to puzzle out what's going on just from these graphs. But uh, what you see is at least a couple of these states, the silence goes very small. Um, and those states correspond to the ones that are pretty easy to predict. So that, that allows the agent to really quickly recognize the end of an utterance and start its next thing without an overlap. So I think I've probably ran a bit long there. So I'm going to cut that here anyway and open up any questions anyone has. Thanks. So we have uh, time for a couple of questions while Jackie's getting set up. Is there any? Okay, then I have, have a, yes. yeah. I have a quick question, Dean. Oh. So could you summarize for us um, what have been sort of the major challenges for the last year on this research? Okay, so, yeah, so the, the major challenges, well, like I said, the, the project I talked about first is just getting started. So, uh, so for the other one, the, really the biggest challenges we've had have been that the, the system's just really complex and it relies on quite a lot of third-party software 
uh, some of which doesn't play nicely with, with others. So, uh, so there's been quite an engineering problem in just getting it to, to work reliably. Uh, from a research perspective, um, I'm going to put the graphs back up there, but we've got two algorithms, um, one of which actually learns uh, the silences really well, uh, but it overlaps too much. Um, and so we've, we've developed a, 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 an alternate algorithm there, which we're still working on. Um, and it, it probably swings the pendulum too far the other way. Um, it hardly ever overlaps, but it could be more aggressive in recognizing the end of an utterance. Uh, the state space is not very rich in that problem, at least as we're currently using it. So we're kind of limited in what we can do. Uh, but that's still the ongoing work, um, both enriching the state space and, and improving the algorithm with with what we have. Thanks, Dan.